Welcome back, everyone. In this lecture, we'll be discussing the very basics of the autoencoder network architecture. So the autoencoder is actually a very simple neural network and will feel very similar to the multilayer perceptron models that we built during the artificial neural network section of the course. And the main idea is that an autoencoder is designed to simply reproduce its input at the output layer. So that means that the key difference between an autoencoder and the typical MLP, multilayer perceptron, or artificial neural network, is that the number of input neurons will actually be equal to the exact same number of output neurons. Typically, in our use cases, we've been either having the output be equal to the certain number of classes we're classifying for, or equal to one neuron if we're dealing with a continuous output. However, in kind of a strange case here for the autoencoder, the number of input neurons is exactly equal to the number of output neurons. Let's explore what this actually looks like and why we would even want to build a network this way. Here we can see an example autoencoder. Notice the shape. We start with five neurons and then we slowly reduce this down to a certain specified number of neurons throughout the hidden layers. So we go from five to three to two. And the main idea here is right in the middle of your autoencoder, you're going to reduce to some desired amount of neurons, essentially trying to capture what information is important. And then in the second half of the autoencoder, essentially the decoding part, you expand this back out to equal the same number of neurons that you started with. So we go from five to three to two, and then back out to three to five again. So we start at five, and then after going through the entire autoencoder, we actually end up back at five. So I wanna walk through these layers and explain this basic idea. And to simplify this even further, let's imagine that we just have a single hidden layer. So we go directly five to two to five. So the idea here is that in order to produce the same output at the final layer, that internal hidden layer, or specifically the internal multiple hidden layers for a real autoencoder example, those hidden layers must actually learn what features are important. And this kind of extreme example basically shows you that in order for this input to be reproduced as output, those two neurons in the hidden layer, they're going to have to learn which inputs are actually important in order to reproduce the output. So they're reducing the amount of dimensions from five to two. So again, here we see a design of five dimensions reduced to two dimensions and then expanded back out to the original five. Notice my use of the word dimensions. I'm not actually saying the word features here. Okay, so again, the feedforward network trained to produce its input at the output layer is all an autoencoder is. We have some inputs, goes and gets reduced to a hidden layer in the middle and then expanded back out to the outputs. The output size again is the same as the input layer. And that hidden representation in the middle attempts to maintain the important input information before being decoded or expanded back out. And then later on, we'll see how we can actually take advantage of that hidden layer to extract meaningful insights. So when we do things like dimensionality reduction, we'll actually be able to train a full autoencoder and then split it in half and directly extract results from that middle hidden layer. But the full autoencoder is actually inputs shrunken down to hidden and then expanded back out to outputs. So this idea is actually extremely similar to principal component analysis. We are trying to reduce the dimensionality into a few principal components. And keep in mind, we can explore stacked autoencoders with more hidden layers. And we'll actually be doing this ourselves uh, throughout the exercise notebooks. Now, a really important note, a lot of students get confused by this term reduction in dimensionality. Keep in mind, those hidden layers is not simply subselecting only certain features. So it's not like you start off with 10 features and then choose eight of those 10 to continue on with. What you're actually doing is you're calculating combinations of the original features to represent the original data in a reduced dimensional space. So again, you're not subselecting features, you're actually taking a little bit of all the features, some percent, depending on the way the autoencoder is trained. So for example, you may take 5% of feature one, maybe 10% of feature two, et cetera, and you decide how important is each feature as you slowly reduce this dimensionality down. And then, that hopefully that hidden layer in the middle is going to learn which features are the most important and how to organize them in a way to reduce the dimensionality. And then to check if it's working or not, we decode or expand this back out to the output layer. 
So again, we're not subselecting only certain features. So what does this actually look like in practice? Well, later on in the next series of lectures, we're going to explore how we can actually use an autoencoder, split it up into two parts, a encoder and a decoder to perform dimensionality reduction. So we'll be able to actually take a three-dimensional data set and then reduce it down to either two or even one dimensions. So notice here we have these two clusters and we're actually able to map them to a lower dimensionality space or lower dimensional space and still maintain that separation. In this particular use case of going down from three to two, that may not look actually very useful to you. However, you can imagine that we've been dealing with data sets that are much, much larger than just three features. So if you have a data set that is maybe 20 or 30 features, something very large, you cannot visualize 20 or 30 features because we can only visualize three-dimensional space. But what you could do is reduce those 20 or 30 features into some lower dimensional space like 2D or 3D and then visualize that. And then that will allow you to see just how clearly separated those classes are. Here we can see that in three dimensions, yellow and purple here have clear separation. And that clear separation is maintained as we reduce this down dimensionality wise. You can imagine that if we start off with a high, high dimension data set that was too highly dimensional to visualize, we could reduce this down to 3D or 2D and then visualize the classes and see just how separable our data set is. And then later on, we'll see how we can apply this to just reveal hidden insights from our data. So the main idea behind an autoencoder is the center hidden layer reduce the dimensionality to learn the most important combinations of original features. And we're going to see two applications of the autoencoder. And they both use an autoencoder, but they use them in very different ways, which is why this is such an interesting network architecture. Because even though you have the same network architecture of inputs being reduced and then matching the output size, you can use them in a wide variety of tasks. So we're going to explore two use cases. One is the more obvious use case of dimensionality reduction, where you essentially, after training an autoencoder, split it in half and just extract the hidden layer outputs. And then the second use case is a really interesting one for noise removal. You'll actually have that hidden layer essentially learn how to filter out noise when reproducing the output. OK, so both of these use autoencoders, but they use them in really different ways, and they're super interesting problem sets. So let's go ahead and, in the next lecture, learn how we can detach an autoencoder into two separate components in order to perform dimensionality reduction. I'll see you there.